Hey, this is YBR with Beam and G Drive, and today we're going to be taking a look at a car called the Doyler Beagle. And this car is kind of interesting because it's inspired by UK cars from the 1960s and the 1970s, which is kind of an unusual inspiration for a vehicle. So it gives us a pretty unique option that is definitely worth taking a look at. So we're going to start with the 1600 manual. It's also available in automatic, but the only difference between them is the actual transmission. Because with this kind of vehicle, the manual option is almost always going to be the superior option. So we're just moving it out of the shadows a little bit so we can take a better look at it. So there's the rear, moving over to the side, and then lastly, all the way to the front. I really like the headlights on this car. Those circular headlights where they're slightly molded into the body, that's just the perfect look for it. And then the rear back half of the vehicle is just kind of a unique look. It's just a little bit different than most vehicles, and overall, I like the way it looks. I also like the taillights, they're really thin. It's a look you just don't see on cars anymore, only SUVs. Now as for the interior, it has the functionality you like to see. It has a working steering wheel, it has working gauges. If we turn the lights on, it does light up, but there's really not that much to light up since this is a car from the 60s, so it's pretty basic. We don't have any sort of fancy touch screen in this thing or anything like that, but we do at least have air vents, so I would assume it would have air conditioning, or at the very least, heat. And I also really like the way the mirrors look. Those circular mirrors just look really good from the inside. It reminds you, yeah, you're driving an old car and it matches well from the outside as well. Now for actual driving, this car isn't the greatest. The good news is it's a rear wheel drive configuration, so it has the right configuration for maximum fun. The bad news is it has a 1.6 liter engine from the 60s, which makes 84 horsepower. So if we wanted to go from 0 to 60, it takes about 12 seconds. And to give you an idea of just how slow that is, if we try to get to 60 miles per hour before we crash into this wall, I don't know if we're going to make it. That's going to be close. 62 miles per hour on impact. So in the base trim, it is not very fast. And looking at the damage, it is a bit spiky on the front, I'm noticing. So you guys can see what you think of the damage, and then we will go ahead and reset it. And then we're going to go to a version that's just as fast as the one we're driving, but it looks different. This is the India Taxi. And on the outside, we have a paint job that looks very, very simple. But I looked it up, and that's just how a taxi might look in India. It's 100% accurate as far as I can tell. We also have these really cool-looking wheels, but they are just hubcaps. So if you yank on it right, there goes just the hubcap, and the wheel is still there, although it is deflated, so it's not going to drive too well. And then also with this one, it doesn't have the exhaust for some reason, so it's just a bit louder as you drive around, but I don't think it really makes a noticeable difference in overall driving performance. So let's try to hit the side of the vehicle, a little bit of the rear, and that is pretty decent. Oh, we lost our wheel. Well, that was fast. We could go ahead and drive this one around just a little bit more, because I was hoping we could do a couple more collisions before we move on to the next one. So let's keep it simple and go straight into the wall. Oh, look at that. The hood flew off, and it landed back on the vehicle so it can continue covering up the engine. What a dedicated hood. And now it flew off the other way. Also, you will notice, sometimes the hood will stick to the vehicle. Like right now, you see it probably shouldn't actually be with the vehicle. And that's thankfully a really minor issue because when you see that, you can literally just grab the hood and yank it away. And then you're like, okay, the glitchiness is gone and we are good to go. So can you still drive? Yeah, not really. That wheel is messed up. So we are now done with the taxi and we're moving on to the next version, which is going to be the 1800. Again, this is available in automatic or manual. But with the 1800, we get an upgraded engine. So it has a 1.8 liter engine that makes 94 horsepower. That means it has enough power to do big jumps just like that. Actually, we could have done that with the other one too. Because it only has 94 horsepower, which is just 10 more horsepower than the previous version. So it's not really noticeably faster. But it is technically faster because it goes from a 0 to 60 of like 12 seconds to a 0 to 60 of 11 seconds. So let's go ahead and try to find another ramp. I like that. Here we go. Nice flight under the canisters. And we are cleared except upside down. And I think we might still be able to drive. So let's go ahead and get this guy back onto his wheels. So he got some damage to the roof. We are missing a wheel, but we can at least put the power down. The real question is though, is how well can we steer? Not at all. I'm trying to go to the right, but it ain't doing nothing. My steering is shot. So let's go ahead and take one final look at the damage. And then we're gonna move on to the next version. And this one is the 2200. And again, it's available in manual or automatic. So with the 2200, now we have a 2.2 liter engine, just as you would expect, 
and it actually has less torque than the previous engine, which is kind of weird and unexpected, but it has more horsepower. This one has 101 horsepower. Yes, it broke the 100 horsepower barrier. We thought it could never be done, but it has been done. So now we can go for a flight at 63 miles per hour. And can we keep on driving after something like that? Oh, what an unfortunate way to land. Even if I could put the power down, I don't think I'd be able to get out of there. It doesn't matter though, because the rear drive shaft is broken. So here is a look at the overall damage to the vehicle. And I want to drive this guy a little bit more so we can see just how fast can he go. So we should be able to get to the highway from here. And my main objective is to see, can this car with 101 horsepower reach 101 miles per hour? Imagine if that was actually the case. If every car could reach a top speed that maxed its horsepower. That'd be absolutely crazy because then you'd have Dodge Chargers flying by you at 700 horsepower if they're the Hellcat version. So there is the highway and to get there we got some damage going on on both the front, top, and bottom. So the rear drive shaft is broken so once again we're no longer going to drive. But here is the damage. And that crash turned out pretty well. Everything there looks nice and reasonable. So let's get it actually onto the highway. And we slap it onto the ground from like 10 feet in the air it looked like. It has affected the driving a little bit, but I don't think it'll really affect the top speed run we're trying to accomplish here. And already we are up past 60 miles per hour, so it's doing a pretty decent job. And it keeps pulling. We're up to 80 miles per hour now. So yeah, this version definitely got some speed to it. We are almost up to 100 miles per hour, even with it having a little bit of damage so it's not driving perfectly straight. There is 100. That was our goal, so now we just bump into the walls and see what happens. Hood is open. I can't see where I'm going at all if I was actually in the car. And I'm just going to let it keep crashing. Rear drive shaft is broken. So we are just going to be finished right now. So here is the damage for you guys to take a look at. Most of it is focused on the front of the vehicle because everything else is mostly intact. So now we're going to go to the fastest production rear wheel drive version, which isn't really saying much. It is the 2500. And you might have noticed, the numbers I'm giving you for horsepower don't match up with the numbers that are shown in the vehicle selector. That's because the numbers I'm using are the actual engine output, where some of the numbers listed for the vehicle are incorrect. So with the 2500, we have 116 horsepower. And this one is easily able to get up to 100 miles per hour if the previous one could. And as an added bonus, this one also has an upgraded suspension, and the interior has been upgraded as well, so you get headrests in the rear seats. So we're now going over 100 miles per hour and we got a beautiful roundabout here to let us go flying into the air and crashing into some trees. That was the biggest crash we've done so far. Unfortunately, we landed in a place where it's hard to see the damage, so car, your roof is going to get destroyed, but you're coming with me back to the road and hopefully I don't crash into too many trees. Stay away from the trees. All right, so ignoring the expanded roof for me yanking on it super hard, let's go ahead and take a look at the damage. So looking on the rear, we even got some damage there. We really banged this thing up all over the place. The side is ruined. And then the front, of course, is the most ruined because it took the biggest amount of that impact. Now we're going to do a car that doesn't quite make sense. So this is the 2500 XSOL four-wheel drive. And on paper, this is the exact car I was driving, but it has four-wheel drive. Yet it feels so much faster for some reason. And normally you wouldn't expect just adding four-wheel drive to do that. If you have a car that's really traction limited, yeah, it'll feel faster with four-wheel drive in those situations. But this car only has 116 horsepower. It's not going to be traction limited from having just rear-wheel drive, yet we are flying with this version, 125 miles per hour and still accelerating before we crash into this wall at a massive speed. It just doesn't quite make sense. And now it's not driving at all. So I'm going to pull it back a little bit so you can take a better look at it. So we got damage on the rear, damage on the side, just damage everywhere. I don't even need to point out every spot because it's easy to point out where there is no damage. Nowhere. Everything is damaged. So what I want to do though, is I want to do a drag race between an all-wheel drive version and the rear-wheel drive version and see if it feels faster or if it's actually significantly faster. So to do that, we're going to go to the drag strip on West Coast USA. And we're going to keep the test nice and simple. First we drive the all-wheel drive version, then we drive the rear-wheel drive version, and we're going to compare the times. And just for fun, I'll give us a car to race against, but I don't want it to be the exact same as mine. I want it to be something where maybe it's faster, maybe it's slower, nobody really knows. So let's get the GTZ version of the Miramar because that's the most obvious car we can compare to. 
And we're gonna launch this thing like I mean it. So I'm gonna try to make sure I drive both cars as fast as they can go. So we're gonna rev it up hard and then just drop the clutch and go. Oh, that was a terrible launch. Whoa, what is going on with those front wheels? That is really interesting. The tires just exploded if you launch it too hard. And I have like no steering. Not at all what I expected. Is that because of the prep track surface or does that just happen every time? We need to figure that out real quickly. So I'm gonna reset it here and we're gonna do the exact same thing where we rev it up and then launch it. Let's see, rev, rev, rev and go. So it is just any surface, if you launch it that hard, the wheels are gonna pop. Interesting. Well, we'll go back to here and we're gonna try this one more time, but this time I'm gonna take it nice and easy with the launch. I'm gonna just ease into it. So in terms of launching capabilities, the rear wheel drive will probably launch almost as good as the four wheel drive in this situation. So I don't think the all wheel drive is really gonna give it much benefit in terms of overall speed. Wow, we are blowing away the GTZ. This is not even fair. Easy victory for me. What are the times? 13.221 at 106 miles per hour. That's just way too fast sounding. That does not sound right, okay? That does not sound right. We're gonna do this again. This time, rear wheel drive only. We're gonna see what kind of time it gets. Because I've never heard of a full sized car with only 120 horsepower getting into the 13s. So I tried to launch that one just as hard as the other one, but in reality, it just has less power, it feels like, and it can't launch as hard. So weird. Oh, look at this. We're going to get beat by the Miramar. That's a big difference. 16 seconds at 86 miles per hour. So you know what it might be? It might be the way the all-wheel drive is implemented. Instead of having a single engine worth of power going to the rear and front wheels, it might have a single engine's horsepower going to the rear and another engine's horsepower going to the front wheels because that would make sense to me. Oh, my bad dude, are you okay? Oh yeah, you won't be so dramatic, you're gonna spin out, huh? Oh yeah, you're gonna be like that. I'll show you a reason to spin out. Oh, get some. So before we switch vehicles, I just wanna point this out. All of the versions we've driven so far have the same looking engine. So there is what that engine looks like. Now, when we go to one of the faster racing versions of the vehicle, such as the Race Stripes version, you'll see this one has a completely different looking engine. So, hood go off, and there is the engine, and this one still says Doiler on it. And it looks really similar to some of the engines that are already in the game, so I'm wondering if it's actually a custom model or if it's based on some of the ones that come with the game. Because if you put it side by side with the racing version of the Miramar, they look pretty similar. But either way, Let's go ahead and drive this guy around for a little bit. So with this guy, we get lots of upgrades. We get a five-speed race transmission, where before we've only always had a four-speed manual. We get the race suspension, race brakes, the paint job, the racing seats. We got racing tires, and we got the engine upgrade that gives us about 250 horsepower, which feels about as fast as all-wheel drive we were driving earlier. Whoa, that looked weird. The car like wiggled. There it is, wiggling again. I think something may have broke when I was just accelerating too hard or something because it does not feel right anymore. All right, go in a straight line. Yeah, I'm trying just to go straight and you can see it's pulling hard to the right. I go left, pull hard. So just from normal racetrack driving, something happened that really messed up the suspension. That is interesting. Well, we got the roll cage, we got the safety. Let's make use of it. Look at that, we even landed on our roof. Roll cage doing its job. Probably can't drive after that, can it? No, it can kind of put down the power a little bit, surprisingly, but not too well. Just enough where we can line it off off of the wall so you can look at the damage, and the damage is severe. That is a lot of damage to the vehicle. So now, let's go ahead and take a look at the other racing version. This is the Stripes version, which is named after the Miramar Race Edition. So it could be something like one race team has two separate cars that compete in two different categories. One is the Miramar, the other is the Beagle. It's always fun to add story to the car. At least for me, I like saying, oh, maybe this is because of this. It might not make any sense practically, but it's nice just to have that little bit of story. And we are going super fast with this guy, 150 miles per hour, so let's have a big crash. That was a beautiful high speed impact. Everything is destroyed. Even the side of the car that we didn't crash into has some dents on it and the door doesn't line up. 
That was a lot of speed there, and, and there's some fire in the background. Nice. Up, oh, it's gone. Fine. Be like that. Buy fire. So next up, we can go ahead and take a look at the drift version of the Beagle. And the drift edition has pretty much exactly what you'd expect, but it also has some other changes, like the rear has been stripped down, so we have no more rear bumper or any badging. And then over on the front, we have a couple of modifications, so we have a little extra front splitter on the bottom, and then extra lights as well, so you can really light things up as you do your drifting. As for the performance parts, it has about the same engine you saw in the race version, but it has a drift suspension setup. Now here's the one problem I have about this car, and it's actually a problem with all of the versions. The parking brake does nothing at all, okay? So here we go. Parking brake is on, right? I am accelerating, and it's not doing anything. And in BMG Drive, I rely on the parking brake a lot to like initialize the drifts. So otherwise, you kind of like waggle the car back and forth to try to drift, and it's just, it's not the way I'm used to drifting in this game. It feels completely different and strange. So that's one thing I would definitely hope gets fixed eventually, just having the parking brake working. In fact, I'm going to just go ahead and say we are done driving this version of the vehicle already. And while we're talking about Drift Editions, there's also the Drift Arts version, which is pretty much identical to the one we were driving, but it has the Drift Arts paint job. So just a nice little paint job. It's very, very subtle. At first it looks just like a plain ordinary white car, but then you see the side of it and you see, oh yeah, there is some color actually going on with this thing. So I'm going to try to drift it here. But again, not the greatest at drifting like this, and I'm already not the greatest at drifting, so this is not looking too pretty. We can get it a little bit sideways at least, so I'll take it. This is a good corner to try to drift, and so like right here would be the perfect time just to tap the e-brake a little bit to get it sliding, but you just can't do that. Really unfortunate. That's my main complaint about the drift versions for sure, is just if you got a drift version, it's got to have an e-brake of some sorts to help try to initialize the drifts. So now we're off-roading a little bit, and we are going to go on our wheels. Nope. Wait. Maybe. Come on, get a lucky roll. Well, we are stuck on our side, so I'm calling this one is done. And now we're going to take a look at the final version we're going to be driving, which is the Green Beagle Rally. So this one has a similar engine to what we just saw, but it's tuned a little bit more for rally racing, it feels like. And it also has its own unique paint job, which you can see here. It even has a hashtag on it. For a car from the 60s, so this is a modern rally car, obviously, because that wouldn't make sense if a car from the 60s actually had a hashtag. And since this is the rally version, it does have the normal body parts on the vehicle, like the rear bumper. It's just basically the race edition, but made for rallying. So you got the rally kind of suspension. And for something like this, it works surprisingly well. This isn't real rallying, mind you. This is just messing around. After we do this, we can try out some real rallying, though, but it's still going. So I'm going to keep it going until it gives it up. And now it's going to give it up because it's going to, yep, lost the wheel upside down. All right, that's enough messing around. Let's go and take this to an actual place for actual rallying. I think the easiest one for that is going to be Small Island, USA. And again, this is another configuration that's going to suffer without having the parking brake. Because on rally racing, that's another situation where I like to use it a lot to just twist the car a little bit more into the corners. But we can't do that. So we're going to have to take things a little bit slower and a little bit more carefully to compensate for that. So here is the rally course and we are off and this one feels a lot like the other all-wheel drive one where it feels like it has a lot more power than it actually does. It moves fast. But then you got the tight corner like here, I want to go to the right so we got a slow way down because we ain't got no e-brake to really do that. And then we go power and it accelerates hard and then we have another corner we have to slow down a lot. Oh big slide, can we save it? Oh yeah! That's actually some all-wheel drive kind of power right there, how it whipped around. So it works decently well for rallying, although it is pulling to the right side annoyingly somehow, and it's just gotten way worse. All right, you go in the dirt, you just play in the mud, whatever you want to do. You did well when you were doing the rally course, but I think you're time to be retired. And with the rear drive shaft, yeah, it's definitely done for. So here's a look at the damage. Not much damage to look at here, but we'll take a quick peek, and then we're going to go ahead and finish things up with Leap of Death. And for Leap of Death, we're going to use the Rally Edition because that one makes the most sense. It should be able to get the most power down on these dirt roads. And I am using manual mode to maximize my power output. And if you believe the speedometer, we're going like 100 miles per hour. That's probably not accurate, but we were going pretty fast. Like 80 to 90 miles per hour could be it because we are flying a very nice distance. That means this is going to be a huge crash. Let's get the slow-mo started. And then here we go, 16 times slow-mo, 100 times slow-mo for maximum damage reveal. Bye-bye, Beagle.
It's going to have a really harsh crash here, but it might be able to survive it a little bit by sliding just a bit down the hill. It's managing to the slide some, so it'll go 16 times slow. We'll speed it up a bit. And then let it fly and let it crash at whatever speed it wants to go. So there's the big boom, and there's the smaller boom. And it should get all the way to the bottom. I think it has a lot of momentum still going. Yep. So that is the Doiler Beagle. Funny name for a car. You know, I never really talked about it, but yeah, it's a strange name for a car. <laughs> but it fits the car. It's a weird name for a kind of unusual car. At least to me, it's unusual because British cars are kind of weird. Anyways, till next time, this has been YBR. And remember, if you like or dislike this video, I will know. I can tell based on how British the car is. It's very British. So do the right thing, and I'll see you next time.